for many years, and uh, he's a professor in pulmonology, and uh, he's going to start off his series of lectures by talking about COPD. Do I need to get that? You got it? I think I'll leave yours up. Yeah, don't do hypertension. It's Let's see if I can find. There is hypertension in lung disease. Right? There is. But you're under, on there. You're on there. Under uh, there. There it is. You got it. Good. All right. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Strange. Good morning, guys. Uh, we're going to talk about COPD today, one of those rare diseases like hepatitis C that uh, is in all of our practices. And uh, I do have disclosures. I do a lot of work for um, the disease alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I run the United States Registry, so I have 5,000 patients with uh, alpha-1 deficiency where the average pulmonary guy has one or two. So I consult for all the alpha-1 companies that make an augmentation pro uh, product. I also do bronchoscopic lung volume reduction for all those guys that have hyperinflated lungs, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, last week's New England Journal of Medicine, uh, one of the lead articles on, on valve treatment for emphysema. So we're going to try and take this at a primary care level and kind of work through. I've got some questions, and I'll let, when the first question comes up, I'm going to let Jan stand up and tell you how to use your cell phone to be able to make this work. And so I'll prep him up for that, unless you want to do it now. Yeah, so let's just uh, text SMA to 22333. So if you'll take your smartphones or your flip phone like I have and text... 22333, and when the questions appear, you'll text the correct letter to the texting string. And uh, how many of you uh, can do that? Raise your hand just to show how many of you are not going to participate. <laughs> 22333. There will be a reduction in tuition <laughs> if you participate. When you leave the conference, I will be giving out $20 bills. Okay, Dr. Strange. All right, so our plan for today is to talk a little bit about diagnosis and then move right on into treatment. And uh, a few things have happened on our diagnosis sphere. You know, for years we've always struggled in primary care to sort out who has asthma and who has COPD. And now that we have some bronchodilators that don't have inhaled steroids in them that are combination inhalers, that would be against the asthma guidelines if we didn't provide them. And so on our diagnostic schema, we've always said that asthma is a reversible airways obstructive disease. That is, you have to improve your FEV1 back to the normal range. And if you do, then you have asthma. But if you don't, then you have COPD. And, and yet we understand now that there are lots of different, we call them phenotypes of COPD. These are individuals that have had lifelong asthma but if they can't return their lung function back to normal, they have remodeled their airways sufficient that they now fall into a COPD category. We have emphysema, we have chronic bronchitis, we have bronchiectasis as all unique phenotypes of COPD. But when you've had asthma all your life and now you can't fix your spirometry completely, I think most of us don't want to give away our best therapy, which is inhaled steroids. We recognize that group of people that have had lots of asthma that now have, in quote, COPD, probably are a unique group of individuals. And so all of our professional organizations in the just this past year have uh, called a new term, the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, or ACOS. And you all have known this for years. A lot of, most of the pulmonologists have known it for years. Is this, there are some of these patients that it's just impossible to classify even though typically our asthma patients are going to have eosinophilic sputum and reversibility of a much higher degree for their airways obstruction in their symptoms. And so uh, just recognize that you've been vindicated. You can write ACOS on your charts now and recognize that in that group of patients we are going to add an inhaled steroid to the other parts of our treatment regimen that indeed they do have COPD as well. Okay, number three, cause of mortality. Number one in men and women is heart disease. Number two, cancer. Number three, COPD, cause of mortality. 
Number four in the world, but moving upwards. It's the only one in the top 10 that continues to increase in prevalence uh, throughout the world and in the United States. Uh, these top two, we're not going to take over anytime soon, but uh, the point here is that this is a real important disease, and particularly for institutions like the National Institute of Health, who spend only 5% of their budget on lung disease. Uh, this is our lobbying effort. We really have to do more in COPD so that we have better messages to uh, say. So in hepatitis B, these studies have 5,000 individuals in them. A lot of our COPD trials are just now trying to get to the level of some of these cardiovascular trials where you have 30,000 individuals in some of the large trials to be able to prove what you need to show for disease. Well, this is the map of the United States uh, on COPD prevalence put out by the CDC. Uh, there are some pockets of disease. Uh, Southern Nevada, particularly, is uh, a hotbed, but there are three people in each of those counties. Uh, but you see, this is the, the population of the South, the Appalachians, the heart of the Southern Medical Association is uh, really embedded in COPD. The I-85 corridor is where all the drug companies set up their COPD clinical trial shops uh, right up and down uh, through North and South Carolina. Um, and as everybody recognizes, these are the states that have historically uh, been embedded in tobacco, and uh, some of that still is um, pervasive, although we're making good progress everywhere. So our first question, a diagnosis of COPD requires cough, dyspnea, wheezing, variably but not completely reversible to therapy, which is A, cough, dyspnea, wheezing that is variably but not completely reversible to therapy in a patient who has previously smoked, Number three, the patient not, need not be symptomatic, incompletely reversible obstruction on spirometry is all that is needed. Or number four, the patient must have symptoms and incompletely reversible obstruction on spirometry. A, B, C, or D, please answer now. Oh, we're getting a little action here. So you can watch, is the, let the audience determine what you're going to put in, right? So uh, it's kind of like. Okay. <laughs> can you change your answer? You know one of them could go up and one of them can go down. That's the only problem with this. You can bias. Yeah, you can bias the response rates. All right, so it seems we have stabilized here. And indeed, 57% of you have the right answer. So the point is that we define this illness on the basis of spirometry. And that's hard if you don't have a spirometer in your office, because if you use symptoms of cough, dyspnea, and wheezing, you overdiagnose COPD by about 30%. You also underdiagnose uh, COPD by about 30%. And that means that only 40% of your patients are you giving some of these expensive therapies to. And so spirometry is needed. And we'll talk about the diagnosis for these, these patients who really don't have symptoms but yet have obstructive spirometry because a lot of them are couch potatoes. They sit there all day long and if without exertion and exercise, they may have no symptoms or they have significant other degrees of uh, comorbidities, heart disease uh, or uh, liver disease or anything else that will influence their, um, uh, their outcome. And so the patient need not be symptomatic to have a diagnosis of COPD. So who gets spirometry? This is the World Health Organization recommendation. Symptoms of cough, sputum, or dyspnea or exposure to risk factors of tobacco, an occupation that's uh, dusty, or indoor and outdoor uh, air pollution. The problem is our U.S. Public Health Service does not recognize that spirometry has any value in a screening function. What does screening mean? Screening means that you go into an asymptomatic population and apply your test. But when you have symptoms, then you're no longer screening, you're providing a test to help determine the cause of symptoms. And some of you that might do industrial medicine will pull out a spirometer on occasion in these dusty environments, uh, but that's outside of uh, U.S. Public Health Service recommendations. So what do you do with the patient who every time they catch a respiratory virus comes in with cough and wheeze and uh, has symptoms? Do you do a spirometry then? 
how many of those patients who have smoked a little bit will have persistent obstruction, and it's the majority of them. So I use those opportunities myself to identify who has obstructive lung disease that then you can come back and do a follow-up spirometry when they're well. But if you miss that opportunity, we recognize there are a lot of patients who have cough and wheeze with respiratory infections for about 10 years before they come in with their dyspnea that is so limiting that your treatment options are less. Because it's the golden opportunity 10 years previously to talk about smoking cessation and make a diagnosis of presumptive COPD. There's no question in kids we have a whole lot of viral respiratory illness that has completely reversible obstruction when the virus is gone. That happens to a lesser degree in adults. How many people have a spirometer in their office? The majority of you. It's a, right now it's about 90% of all primary care offices have a spirometer. Uh, having one doesn't mean that you feel comfortable with using it and interpreting it, and so what we recommend is uh, send your point person in the office. It can be anyone uh, that there, uh, is there and willing, but to learn how to do the calibrations in the morning, to come and sit at a university pulmonary function laboratory. Uh, we've got uh, seven respiratory therapists doing about 120 spirometries in a day. It's one of these things for a university where they would love to have your office staff come in and learn the calibrations and the techniques and be able to uh, just kind of work through some patients and what they have at the end of the day. And then we have algorithms for interpretation, but those sorts of uh, things are beyond the scope of this lecture. The point being is that the obstruction that you see is pretty nonspecific. And remember that obstruction means that if you exhale long enough in the blue line here, that you're going to get out a near normal forced viral capacity, and it's really the FEV1, FVC ratio that defines our obstructive physiology. Obstruction doesn't tell you if this is asthma or if this is COPD, but I'll have to tell you that I see a whole lot of restrictive disease. This is disease that limits how much air you've got in your lungs. That's an FEV1 over FVC ratio here in the yellow that is above 0.7. That means more than 70% of your air comes out in the first second who then get albuterol and COPD inhalers just to see if they help, when reality of restrictive lung disease means that this is not an airways disease. This is another disease that is limiting the amount of total lung capacity you can get into your lungs. So this would be the large heart taking up part of the thorax, the scarring interstitial lung disease, most common in America, obesity that weighs on your chest and limits the amount of air that you can inspire. Therefore, what you expire as a forced viral capacity has to then be less. So it is real important to sort out obstruction and restriction and apply your therapies accordingly. The list of restrictive lung diseases, 250 of them. You've got to do more work. That's imaging and, and uh, thinking through all the different kinds of interstitial lung disease, one of our topics for two days from now. Uh, but obstructive lung disease is pretty limited. Let's try and do bronchodilation uh, with or without steroids is our uh, indication for therapy. So how, often, how commonly do we see COPD? COPD um, is a disease of aging. So when we start getting our best statistics, we're talking about people over the age of 45. It's everybody in this room, it looks like, but the point here is that uh, it is as common or mo more common than asthma and diabetes in this population, so a very common disease. And when we start looking at it in, in terms of why do we want to make the early diagnosis, well, I'll, uh, your next lecture is on hypertension. Does it really matter today if your blood pressure's uh, uh, 160 over 110? No, you're not going to die of that, but you're interested in what's going to happen in 10 years with their stroke and their heart attack and their progressive atherosclerotic disease. And in the same vein, you're interested in your FEV1, FVC ratio, not today because in 10 years, if you keep smoking, you're going to show up in my ICU with end-stage COPD, and obviously uh, that uh, dyspnea and exacerbations and respiratory failure is really what you're trying to do by turning on interventions at an earlier stage of disease. Every, I think everybody in the room has probably seen through medical school the fletcher pito diagram of what happens as we uh, start as babies and grow, grow, grow our lung function up until the age of 25. 
and then we're all over the hill. We start having the normative decline of our lung functions. So if we all live out to 120 years old, we'll all have FEV1s less than a liter and be huffing around, but by then you won't be able to walk very fast anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, what happens, though, is about 20% of our uh, smokers start taking this course of accelerated decline in lung function. And when you take that accelerated course in lung function, what that means is that you're going to present at an age, usually around 60 or 70, with uh, FEV1s that are low enough to have symptoms. And once you have symptoms, you're always going to have symptoms. And so we'll turn on therapy at the time of symptoms. And then all of us have in our practices the patient that we've had for 25 years with progressive but more severe COPD that really is a burden of, for their our quality of life and also for our practice care. What would happen if we caught that little cough and we is at age 45 here and convinced that individual to stop smoking? What's been shown in the lung health studies, uh, it's a whole group of normative smoking and non-smoking diseases, is that you return your course of FEV1 decline back to that of the normal population. And now you've got a 75-year-old person coming to see you with a little bit of dyspnea. Do they have COPD? Yes, they have COPD, even though they quit smoking 20 years ago, because of this, uh, this long number of symptom-free lives that you achieved by getting them to be recognized as having COPD much earlier in their lives by falling off the curve of normality. All of our spirometers these days have a thing called lung age on them. So if you tell somebody, oh, Ms. Jones, your, your FEV1 is 80% predicted, it really should be closer to 100 uh, they will instead translate that you've got the lungs not of a 40-year-old but of a 52-year-old. Don't you think you ought to stop smoking? And those randomized trials of how you communicate your spirometry show decreases in, in smoking uh, rates very much uh, better than by using percentages that not everybody understands. So this, these are the uh, curves from the CDC of those that are currently diagnosed with COPD. Uh, this is an older slide out of the NHANES from 2002, and I hope we've done a little bit better, but we've not had spirometry out in the field and, and general prevalence uh, indications for a long time here. But obviously what this shows is that as you age, you have more and more COPD. And how much more? Well, if you're older than age 75, then a full quarter of the population has COPD. So how many people have one in four patients with seven, uh, over the age of 75 in their practices that have COPD written on their chart? Probably not as many as we should. And so this whole concept of let's make sure you're exercising, the exercise agenda very uh, evidence-based these years. But if you're exercising and short of breath with exercise, that's not part of normative aging. You have a disease, and now figuring out whether it's heart or lung disease becomes part of that agenda. We have a lot of new tools coming for primary care as well. We recognize this is really tough in primary care to put a spirometry into the mix of a very busy office practice. And so we've been trying to figure out the right questionnaires that the receptionist can hand out in the waiting room for people that have ever smoked we define smoking as 100 cigarettes in a lifetime. And that's our uh, new definition, it's not so new, of, of the tr true smoker. But one behind the barn as a teenager doesn't really count. But if you've smoked 100 cigarettes, that means that you have an 80% chance of smoking more than 10 pack years in your life. So it's a pretty rapid screen, and people start thinking back to their early 20s and what happened uh, and whether they really had enough um, uh, cigarette smoking to qualify now as 100 cigarettes in a lifetime. But obviously, the questions on most of these are a dyspnea question, an age question, a cigarette smoking question, recognizing that only 80% of our current patients with COPD have smoking in their past history. Our guidelines for COPD are set by the World Health Organization. They're endorsed by My American Thoracic Society and the American College of Chest Physicians, the Europeans and the Japanese. So I think everybody's bought into the guidelines. 
I find them a little bit burdensome, but I'll kind of go through them with you to show you what's out there. This is my personal step care model, which I like a little bit better, but I'm biased, but it starts, starts number one with smoking cessation, and then we bronchodilate. We try and prevent exacerbations. Prevention of exacerbations is because exacerbations are the single most costly part of COPD care. Um, when we try and treat exacerbations, we try and sort out how many of these are infectious. Our most uh, important measure of who needs an antibiotic is actually sputum color, uh, but we define exacerbations on the basis of change in color or volume or dyspnea, um, which are the classic Antonison criteria that have been around for about 20 years. And then we have the uh, keep recognizing the importance of our expectant therapies, which include pulmonary rehab uh, and uh, Im immunizations. Uh, oxygen when it's appropriate, and then I'll show you about the uh, hyperinflation therapies at the end. So let's kind of work through our guidelines here. Um, smoking prevalence trends, everybody is down in their states. Uh, South Carolina, that used to be 30%, is now down to 19% of the population who still smokes. It tends to be a very um, uh, community-based process where your, if your friends smoke, you smoke, and so some of you will be in communities where smoking is still a trend. Uh, and it seems like when you look at education levels, you have to have actually graduated from college before those trends get down to almost negligible these days. But the education of the individuals who smoke still is obviously less, and many of these individuals have less than high school, and so there is a demographic issue associated with smoking. Some of our lung health studies showed that if you quit smoking, you actually can improve your FEV1. Don't look too hard at the y-axis here. This is in liters, but from going from 2.8 to 2.9 liters might not be too clinically significant, but you actually can, truthfully, because these were 5,000-person studies, say that statistically your lung function will improve if you stop smoking. Uh, more importantly, though, as we all recognize, is that what you're really doing when you stop smoking is you're changing the slope of future lung function decline from a very flat slope to a more accelerated slope if you maintain your cigarette smoking status. So it's not uh, untrue when you say that, uh, yes, your lungs will get better if you, if you stop smoking, Mr. Jones. The American Lung Association puts out a report card every year. Uh, we, this is the first year we're celebrating because we didn't get straight Fs in South Carolina. Um, we, uh, the four pieces of this are whether you have smoke-free air that's more, that's a state law. Ours are all community-based. Uh, we spend uh, zero dollars on tobacco prevention and control spending. We decided to send all of our health care dollars to Medicaid. Uh, cigarette taxes uh, used to be nine cents a pack. We're up to about 75 cents a pack. So, but New York's are, I think it's 8.50 a pack uh, here. Uh, the single most important uh, tool that's used for youth access to tobacco is is taxes, and then uh, cessation coverage. We actually put a state law, but it's one of the weakest laws in the in the state, in the nation, for having to cover the cessation products until they get over the counter, then you don't have to cover them anymore. Uh, and that's why we get a D this year. And so we're out of the other seven states that have straight Fs, um, and there are no states in the nation that have straight As. All right, so let's get into our gold guidelines. This is where I find a few little bits of burden, and I think it's going to be a little bit hard to see, so I'm going to walk you through this. Um, I think it's been recognized for a long time that if we just use FEV1 as a percent predicted, we can stratify patients on the basis of how much obstruction you have with lung function testing. But we also recognize that about half of the patients show up in emergency rooms with their COPD with exacerbations of disease where their FEV1s are more than 50% of predicted. And so this whole concept of exacerbation frequency and how it influences disease is increasingly important because emergency room access and then hospitalizations drives cost in this disease. And so what the COPD gold guidelines tried to do was integrate uh, the risk on your airflow limitation for being the patients with FEV1s less than 30% predicted 
and one's being a ratio of FEV1 to FVC less than 0.7, uh, who also have a spirometry and FEV1% predicted value greater than 80%. So mild spirometric disease down here, severe up here, with your risk for exacerbations, and then looking down on the x-axis with dyspnea scores. This is called the Medical Research Council dyspnea score. If you're not very short of breath and you have very uh, good spirometry relatively, you end up being an A. If you have lots of dyspnea, and you have lots of exacerbations, and you have bad spirometry, you're in C or D, and D is the, the dyspnea prone, and C's are the dyspnea not prone patients. And so when you start looking at the numbers of exacerbations per year, to me this gets a little bit too complicated. And to next step are all the medicines you're supposed to remember around which bucket you put people in, A, B, C, or D. And so I try and do this a little bit differently, and I think there's been a whole lot of backlash against the gold guidelines. Um, I'm presenting them to you because they are our COPD guidelines uh, that are uh, prescribed by professional organizations. But to me, it's not too hard to think that if I'm having exacerbations of my disease more than two times a year, I need to up the ante here. And usually we will up the ante with, I'll show you all the exacerbation treatment choices in a minute, but it's either going to be long-acting beta agonist, long-acting muscarinic antagonist, or an inhaled steroid, or all three of disease, depending upon your exacerbation history. And if you are not having exacerbations, then we're targeting your quality of life and your symptom control with bronchodilator therapy, not necessarily with an inhaled steroid, which has unique uh, applicability to the exacerbation prevention and to the patients that have asthma overlap. And so we'll get into our medicines in a minute, but you'll see a lot of our new medicines are combination bronchodilators that don't have an inhaled steroid in them. But steroid, inhaled steroids are our best medicine for exacerbation reduction uh, when comparative studies are done. Okay, so that means we need to know what an exacerbation is. So we have four choices for the definition. The first is a cough productive of more or different colored mucus that requires an antibiotic. The second is worsened COPD symptoms outside the range of day-to-day -day variability for that patient. Number three is, or C is worsened symptoms of COPD that use additional therapy. And number four, worsening COPD symptoms sufficient to require emergency room or hospital therapy. Please answer now. Oh yeah, we get at least three choices going here. Ah yeah, here we come in with four. All right, and so the bees have it, and that is the correct answer. So the CDC got involved in the exacerbation definition, and then the FDA got involved. And so if you, as you may have recognized, there are some medications now that actually have an FDA indication for exacerbation reduction. Therefore, they needed to put in place a definition of exacerbation because they need to count them. They count them in number per year or time to next exacerbation, time to first exacerbation after a, a medicine has started or not. And so they actually uh, had to figure out what an exacerbation is. And we know that when people start coughing more or having more dyspnea or having a change in color of their sputum, then everybody with COPD has a little bit of up and down with that on an everyday basis. And so the tools that are used these days to do an exacerbation reduction indication for the FDA are actually daily diaries. And you get home and the exact instrument is a tool where you answer 14 questions before you go to bed tonight with a little keypad, goes in and uh, all the patients in these trials actually figure out how much their intrinsic day-to-day -day variation is. And things outside their intrinsic day-to-day -day variation in cough, sputum, and dyspnea will then trigger a definition of exacerbation. The average exacerbation lasts about five to seven days in most of our studies. And uh, when we have an exacerbation, if you have good lung function, then what happens is you usually don't come and see a primary care doctor. What do you do? Well, you take a little bit more albuterol, you 
Uh, you may ask and call in for an antibiotic. Uh, the point here is that a lot of these are under the radar, and what we found in all of our COPD exacerbation studies is about two-thirds of them show up at your primary care office where you may do one of many different things. And so the right, right definition here is that uh, a lot of patients don't require an antibiotic for their exacerbations. In Europe, about 10% of patients with a COPD exacerbation get an antibiotic. Here in the United States, it's about 70% of patients get an antibiotic, and there's no difference in resolution of exacerbations between the two groups. Um, the uh, additional therapy definition is tracked by the FDA because obviously if you need additional therapy or if you show up for an ER or hospitalization, those are happening usually in more severe patients but are also important health economic indicators that are tracked in all of our exacerbation reduction studies. So we have all sorts of good medical uh, journals like the Daily Mail uh, that are trying to figure out what's causing the exacerbations out there. And I think we have been doing a lot of these microbiome studies in COPD over the past few years. This one pulled out Helicobacter out of the lungs during exacerbations. We've just finished some uh, studies in Alpha-1 that will be published soon. But the concept of what makes an exacerbation happen is indeed a, a bloom of pre-existing germs that live in our lungs. And we used to think the lungs were sterile. Now we know that all of us carry about 20 or 30 different germs in our lower airways. And then under times of stress, those single species that you're able to bring into culture bloom in our lungs. Uh, and what happens at the end of your exacerbation is those same germs are still there despite therapy uh, or even if you didn't have therapy at all. So culture doesn't really help us very much. Uh, antibiotics can speed the uh, clearance of our bacterial colony forming units, but I think we have a whole lot to understand about what causes stress sufficient to make a bacteria or a virome bloom. And some of those are environmental stressors, dust, dirt, fumes, and some of those are actually true blooms that would progress to pneumonia if we didn't catch them sooner. And obviously, the lower the lung function is, you don't want to take your patients that are very marginal in their performance status and let them uh, not have antibiotics. So what happens is the more severe your patient is, the more antibiotics we all tend to use out of an altruistic uh, environment. So you don't want to miss the possibility that they're progressing to respiratory failure. So a lot of work still to be done in exacerbations, and I think you'll, what you'll find is that uh, there's a huge heterogeneity even among pulmonologists on who gets antibiotics, who gets the dose pack of prednisone or solumedrol uh, oral pills, and who just gets intensified bronchodilator therapy are three options. We only have so many hammers right now. One of our hammers is antibiotics that are con given continuously, and this is the New England Journal of Medicine from 2011 that showed azithromycin, 250 milligrams every day for one year, compared to placebo for one year, decreased exacerbation frequency by about 10%. Uh, azithromycin, as you know, is an airways anti-inflammatory uh, based upon biopsy studies down the airways. So, we should go out and put everybody with COPD on azithromycin for a year, right? How many people do that? Not a single hand. Does anybody have a single patient that has this regimen? I do. And I think the point is that when we have that patient that has three or four exacerbations in a year and they're fragile, we'll sometimes march into this regimen. And when we do, we have to watch hearing. And uh, we do recognize at the end of a year we have more azithromycin-resistant organisms in our airways. Uh, but these are the kind of studies that are being done looking at yearly exacerbation frequencies. We would like to do this with non-antibiotic regimens because obviously azithromycin and its impact on the population is important. Reflumolast studies have been done in the same way, one of our newer COPD medications. The results aren't quite so high and we have a whole lot more uh, resist, uh, uh, side effects of reflumolast than we do for azithromycin. So our tools for exacerbations, for acute exacerbations, we have strategies. And these are our intensified bronchodilator regimens, systemic steroids uh, to improve lung function, systemic steroids. So in Europe, instead of antibiotics, they're giving everybody a little bit of prednisone for a week uh, to get them through their exacerbations. 
And then uh, when we have green and yellow sputum pulling out the antibiotic uh, and we recognize about 10% of our patients with uh, gold 4 or advanced COPD have pseudomonas in their sputum. So that's a little bit more tricky to start uh, thinking about the germs that are involved in some of our exacerbations. On the maintenance side, this becomes part of our agenda for exacerbation reduction, one of our very important goals in COPD. And that's obviously smoking cessation, our pharmacotherapy that has been proven to help with exacerbation reduction for which there are FDA indications, include our combination Lava-Lama inhalers uh, and teotropium and reflumolast. Uh, and what's been shown are that our vaccinations make a difference. And my favorite tool, which is pulmonary rehab that markedly decreases exacerbation. Okay, so let's get into our drugs. We have a, uh, COPD drugs, I think there were now 14 new ones in 2015. It is the single largest disease state for which you have more medicines this year than you had last year, even after watching that hepatitis C virus presentation with all the new drugs. But there are a lot of them, and the pipeline is just full of more coming. And uh, what's happening is that uh, we have a lot of funny names you've never heard of before that are populating the shelves in your practices. Uh, your formulary committee gets pretty active in whether you, they want to pay for a 24-hour or a 12-hour LABA inhaler, because we've had LABA inhalers like Salmeterol around for a, a long time. Uh, but the two new ones are both licensed for COPD. As you know, all LABAs come with a black box warning against worsened asthma death, as we sometimes have to explain. Uh, but these are the first two 24-hour LABAs that are out there, and obviously you can't do one of these for asthma these days because you have to then prove that you have a concomitant inhaled steroid into the mix, which would be guideline-based care. There are no comparative trials other than against other bronchodilators, and uh, each one of these kind of comes with different platforms for how you use them. And so our pharmacists are sometimes good at telling our patients how to do it, but when they come in, ask them to bring their inhalers so they can demonstrate to you their inhaler use. And, uh, you know, it's these uh, new uh, mist inhalers. I had somebody about two months ago, and when I asked them to use it, they unbuttoned their shirt and put it underneath their uh, armpit, and so it wasn't helping their COPD very much. Um, so let them show, them show you how they use them in the office while you're seeing the patient and you can actually bill for training uh, for you or your nurses uh, around their inhaler use is one of our uh, tools. We have lots of new LAMAs, long-acting muscarinic antagonists out there. We've had for years for Riva. Riva came out uh, as a Respimat or MIST device, which you see in the first panel there. Uh, the Ellipta uh, device is Glaxo's new platform for all of their drugs. Uh, you, meclidinium is theirs. Uh, we also have uh, glycoperonium and uh, acladinium is the uh, Tudorza preparation that are out there as comparators. These are all the ones that are currently FDA approved. We have uh, one new ICS LABA combination in the past year. That's the Brio Ellipta that's licensed uh, now both for asthma and for COPD. Uh, it's, its advantage over the three on the top is that it's a 24-hour compared to a 12-hour. A lot of our formulary committees have said 12 hours is good enough because there are no comparative trials between any of these that show one is superior uh, than another. And so all of these kind of, in COPD, you can go against uh, um, nebulizer or albuterol care. And so all the trials to get through the FDA and COPD mean that you really can clean the slate of all other medications. And so they're almost placebo-controlled trial, except for the short-acting bronchodilators that are the comparative arm. Whereas in asthma, the trials are much more difficult to do uh, because you have to keep uh, the patient safe on the placebo group because placebo requires an inhaled steroid through all of this. In the big scheme of life, we always wanted to prove that if we were aggressive with bronchodilator and anti-inflammatory care in the airway, we could actually change mortality. And so one of the trials that's been reported out at the European meeting, but not yet come out in paper form, is Summit. This is the largest trial in COPD uh, that has been done recently. I uh, remember the Glaxo 25,000 uh, patient trial that got us the black box warning around the beta agonists uh, was done about two decades ago. 
But this was 16,000 patients that were randomized to one of four arms of therapy around uh, Volantarol, Furor, and, and Fluticasone combination uh, to try and figure out if LABA uh, ICS therapy changed mortality if applied aggressively in patients with a cardiovascular risk factor. We know the number one cause of death in COPD is not respiratory failure from COPD, but it's heart attacks. And uh, cardiac disease is the single leading cause, and obviously there's a shared risk factor there, which is the cigarette smoking part of this. But if you smoke cigarettes and don't have COPD, your risk of cardiovascular disease is half of what it is if you have COPD. And the nihilists would say, well, that's just because they smoked more enough to have COPD, but there's something more to it. And it's the, we think that having COPD incites systemic inflammation, and systemic inflammation adds to our cardiovascular disease burden about twofold in all of our studies. And so the point is to recognize COPD in your clinic says that you're at extra risk for all the other comorbidities that come with aging and with smoking. So there's more depression and there's more osteoporosis. There's more diabetes, there's more coronary disease. Uh, there's more Alzheimer's, interestingly enough. And so the point is COPD, we think, is important to recognize because it turns up the thermostat in your practice for looking for the other comorbidities that happen with aging. Summit end up being a negative study. This was uh, initiated in 2011. Uh, there were no differences in mortality uh, over the course of time between the groups of any of these four, including placebo. This was a big disappointment for GSK, as you might imagine. They laid off about, uh, I don't know how many people out of the GSK office. They've changed their model around to not having drug reps out in the community as a result of not having a mortality signal. Does this mean that you don't need to give therapy to COPD anymore? Well, we think that we do uh, need to give therapy because therapy improves quality of life and symptoms of our patients, uh, but it is not associated, at least at this time, with a mortality improvement in large studies that have been done. And this is going to be a very controversial study as it comes out, but I think nobody's going to go after the ICS LABA uh, mortality signal again because at least half of that mortality is not respiratory failure. It's the other comorbidities that are associated with COPD. And it did improve the rate of decline in lung function on the positive side. The new kids on the block are the LAMA-LABA combinations. Recognize these do not have an inhaled steroid in them. The first of these out the gate was Glaxo's Anoroellipta, Volantrol Eumeclidinium. Uh, there have been two more that have come out over the course of the last year. So why would you use a dual bronchodilator? Well, what happens with one bronchodilator is you get about 80% of the lung function. Uh, whether it's a, a LAMA or a LABA, but the addition of the other gives you another 20%. Does 20% make a difference? Well, it depends on your patient and what their goals are. And if they sit on the couch all day long, they may not need to be optimally bronchodilated, but if they're walking the mall and they're going to pulmonary rehab, uh, then maybe it does. And so most people love these inhalers because it gives them optimal bronchodilation. Uh, for a long period of time. Uh, these medicines are 24-hour bronchodilators and they don't, they can leave their albuterol at home. They, uh, they don't need to carry their short-acting bronchodilators as often or use them as often. There's no contraindication for their use. Uh, but when you optimally bronchodilate the airways with two long actings, uh, then that has been the treatment experience. We get now to the triple combinations of the LAMA, LABAs, and ICS, and we don't yet have one of these licensed in the United States. The first one was licensed in India last year, uh, but they're coming, and the trials are in place, and so recognize that you're going to see lots of new drugs coming out, and a lot of these are uh, combinations of uh, all these different medicines that you're seeing. Uh, to my mind, we're going to have to really prove that they make a difference in some meaningful way before they're going to end up in most of our hospital or clinic formularies, uh, but recognize there's going to be lots of wars between all the different companies trying to uh, get a drug uh, out there that has the triple combination um, features. The big players here are GSK and Pearl Therapeutics that was just bought by AstraZeneca and uh, Cheesy uh, uh, out of um, Europe. So, so I rehab a little bit. 
pulmonary rehab programs in everybody's community? Most about three quarters, yes. Um, these, just like cardiac rehab, in my mind, are the single most important intervention that we give to our patients that are over and above what a primary care practice has sent in to see me for COPD. So I see a lot of the referrals from around the state and you've got all the medicines right, you, all the patients have quit smoking, and everybody's doing an optimal thing, but when you ask them about their exercise regimen, they're kind of sitting around or they go for a walk once a week. Uh, they walk after dinner with their wife down the block and back. But pulmonary rehab is a different program. It is a program where we pull out our respiratory terrorists, our young girls with whips, uh, and uh, to get your grandma on the treadmill to be able to start exercising. And they start slow. They monitor for oxygen desaturation. They watch your heart rate. They'll check your blood pressure. As you overcome this barrier to the whole family saying, oh, grandma, you got to take it easy. You're getting too short of breath. We want you to be so short of breath that you're gasping at the end of your re exercise regimen because that's the way we improve our muscle aerobic metabolism. We're trying to make grandma's muscles be athlete's muscles. Why do we want grandma's muscles to be athlete's muscles? Well, if they are, they need less oxygen for any given amount of work, and they also then produce less carbon dioxide per unit of work. And how do we get carbon dioxide out of our body? Well, we have to breathe it out. So grandma walks 30 feet and she's short of breath, but if we can turn her muscles into athlete's muscles, she can walk 60 feet. That's two aisles of Walmart instead of one before she gets short of breath. And is that quality of life improvement? Absolutely, and so we're trying to turn grandma into an athlete. So how are you going to convince the family to turn grandma into athlete becomes part of this conversation, and it's really hard to do. Your job is to screen for cardiovascular disease, to tell grandma's family to park on the far side of the Walmart parking lot. We don't want to use the, this is the opportunity around the uh, disability sticker for the car to say, we really don't want you to be using this. We want you to, to go way on out there. And so you have to walk in so that you're getting some exercise. But the pulmonary rehab programs are the way to overcome that. And it's they start slow, but they push it if they're good. Some of them aren't good. Some of them don't push hard enough. And so if you're getting a lung transplant, you have to come to my pulmonary rehab center before you get one because some of the community ones aren't being aggressive enough. And so in those sorts of programs, we're really pushing very, very hard, trying to optimize exercise in a safe environment. Uh, there's some people that can't do it because of hip disease. We couldn't send Basil up there to do pulmonary rehab this week. Uh, but you have to work through what you can to be able to optimize exercise. Evidence A that it makes a difference in quality of life, mortality, hospital readmissions. It's at level of evidence A across the board that these things help. And so of all the things we do great in COPD, we're great with medicines, we're not so good at pushing our patients out to exercise. Here's the fitness center in South Florida that I like. We've got a little escalator that goes up to the front door, right? So uh, you got the idea here. So uh, this is uh, the deconditioning spiral we're going against. Um, and I was going to end talking about emphysema, and I think I'm right on time for good questions. Um, and so emphysema is a little bit different phenotype in, our, in COPD disease. And we all recognize this means for our patients, this is holes in the lung. We're, we're uh, dropping out interalveolar septi and making lots of small alveoli into one larger alveolus. When we do that, we lose a lot of the elastin, the little rubber bands inside of our airways that help the lung elastic recoil occur. And so one of the things unrecognized in emphysema is that we're also losing the small airway tethering effects of the lung elastins there so that when you expire, your airways collapse and cause airways obstruction. We don't yet have a medicine that fixes this part of the emphysema phenotype. And so when we are talking to our patients about why we can't improve things with medicines, and we have the discussion about stem cells and how they may or may not be able to add some connect connective tissue elements to our lungs uh, uh, 20 years from now, it's all about, sometimes I'll draw out this picture where your airways collapse and we really can't fix that part right now. 
What that means, though, is that your lungs are bigger because air comes in and it can't come back out. And this doesn't happen but about 20% of our COPD patients. And the only ways you're going to sort out who has emphysema and who has other forms of COPD is by doing a set of lung volume tests. These are done at your hospital PFT laboratory. Uh, we're looking at your total lung capacity and more specifically this blue bar called the residual volume. This is the trapped gas inside of your lung. And let's think about it. If your RV gets too big, air comes in but won't go out, Mrs. Jones starts climbing a flight of stairs and she has a breath in and then she starts breathing a little bit faster and her residual volume and her total lung capacity with every breath starts dynamically increasing. So at the top of her stairs, her lungs are bigger than they ever were at the bottom and now she gets chest tightness. And she says, and what can she do there? Well, her lungs are so full, she can't take the next breath in, even though this is an expiratory airflow disease. And she loses her breath, and her chest gets tight. And she comes and tells you all about this, and you do what? Exactly. She goes to the cardiologist. They say, well, sometimes stress tests are sometimes negative. We need to do the cardiac cast. So half of our referrals for this patient come after the cardiac cast says, oh, you got clean coronaries. Uh, it must be, must be your lungs. And so the cardiologist sends us half of these patients. And so just recognize that there is this emphysema phenotype. And yes, we, uh, we're all about screening for cardiovascular disease too, the number one killer in America. But after your stress test is negative, recognize this phenotype of hyperinflation uh, due to COPD. Uh, this week's New England Journal of Medicine had uh, the, um, the, uh, the pulmonic valve being used in Europe uh, was a randomized controlled trial out of the Netherlands that showed improvements in the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire of 12 points in patients that got valves compared to placebo. Valves go down with a bronchoscope. They're one-way valves, kind of like a duck call, turned up into our airways and our lobes of worst emphysema. So air comes out but can't go into that lobe. And so the lobe will shrink. When grandma goes up the stairs, her diaphragms are higher. Parts of her lungs can hyperinflate, but it won't press down her diaphragm. She won't get as much hyperinflation. And spiriva. All of our laba lama com laba ICS combination medications improve your St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire on average about four points. These sorts of therapies have been shown in Europe under randomized controlled trial fashions to improve on average your St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, your quality specific symptom of life scores, threefold better than all of the inhalers that we have out there. That's why we're really excited to see all the phase three trials finishing up here in the United States. And uh, we have uh, two different valves. Um, Spiration was just bought by Olympus. Uh, Pulmonics is out there. Uptake Medical uses a steam to steam treat the areas of emphysema to cause a little scar in the lungs just in the areas of emphysema but not injuring the rest of the lung. And the Renew Coil, uh, which was just bought by a company in London called BTG, uh, for I think it was like $250 uh, million, dollars, uh, is finishing its phase three trials here in the United States. I'm going to show you just one of these. This is the coil. These are made of nitinol. Nitinol is the same metal that doesn't rust that they use in coronary stents and all your other vascular indications. This coil uh, actually goes out into lung in a sheath that, and it will go out into the areas of worst emphysema and advance this sheath all the way out and then we'll pull back the stylet and so this is the little sheath out there and then this coil gets pushed down and as it goes out it is in a straightened form but as the sheath comes back it's going to grab that distal lung tissue with a little ball and then coil back on itself as it retracts that lobe of emphysema inside the lung. So we put a coil out here and a coil out here and we put a coil out here and we just go out throughout the areas of different airways and so we're left with lungs that have little pieces of metal stuck in them and so our emergency room guys are calling us all the time saying what's all this stuff in the lung 
But this is a patient with coils in the areas of their worst emphysema that have been shown beneficial in the European randomized controlled trials. So all four of those therapies that I showed you are EMEA approved in Europe and have been for three years. None of them are approved in the United States, and yet uh, the first of these will land next year at the FDA for approval here. And recognize this isn't for everybody with COPD. This is a unique phenotype of COPD with lots of hyperinflation from their emphysema and the volume reduction and the elastance enhancement that we think happens from these uh, is important. All right, let's move to our last question and then we'll be done. And this is the hospital discharge planning for COPD is improved with decreased hospital returns when the following is performed. Um, should we give a patient a home nebulizer for medication use? A, the patient is required to go to pulmonary rehab within one month of discharge. B, the patient is given a BiPAP unit for chronic respiratory failure with a PCO2 greater than 55 millimeters at hospital discharge. C, or all of the above decrease hospital returns? D, please answer now. Hospital uh, readmissions for COPD, big deal these days. Your hospital gets dinged by from 1% to 3% of total Medicare revenue if you can't hit your quality indicators of COPD readmission rates. Okay, we've got... All right, it seems to stabilize. Number B is the wrong answer. It is true that patients that go to pulmonary rehab within one month of hospital discharge have markedly decreased uh, readmission rates. And that's because not only are our pulmonary rehab centers making sure you have compliance with all your medicines, you actually got them at the pharmacy, you're taking them, you're coming to pulmonary rehab, and you're starting your exercise. Exercise improves airway clearance, so it's a very big and important one of these. Um, but it also has been shown that if you give a patient a nebulizer at discharge, they do better. It's been shown also in asthma that patients do better. And why is that? When we think about um, our refill rates for inhalers in America with their associated cost, is about 30% of all medicines that you prescribe. And the nebulizer medications fall under Medicare Part B, uh, the Medicare Part D medications end up being under their prescription plan and so that people can go and get Medicare Part B prescriptions which are short-acting uh, anticholinergic and uh, uh, beta agonist medications and fill them more often and don't have to worry about the cost associated with uh, compliance. And so these are randomized trials and they show that you have decreased hospitalization uh, returns. And the last one here is recognizing that group of patients that have a PCO2 greater than 55 do qualify for support with chronic ventilation at night. And uh, this is a group of uh, devices that uh, we trial with BiPAP in the, in the hospital, but uh, they go home and wear their BiPAP or like uh, ventilation uh, machine at home every night. And what that does is rest, rest their respiratory muscles. They then thrive the following day because they've got rested and stronger respiratory muscles and have better airway clearance and fewer exacerbation, exacerbations. So the right answer, D, all of the above is, co is correct. And, uh, and what that means is that we really are all about disease management programs for COPD uh, that markedly decrease uh, returns. That's just putting somebody to dog this patient when they go home, make sure they get their medicines, they get to rehab, they get devices for ventilation if they need it. And all the studies have really shown that these uh, programs really dramatically decrease our hospital re returns. Uh, one of my funny slides, uh, this was one of our lung health studies where um, people actually got handed their inhalers, but they didn't know there was a counter inside of it. And so what happened when you came back for your visit, there were the 12% of patients that fired their inhaler more than 100 times on the day before the visit uh, with the doctor. So it was <laughs> the recognition that, oh, I'm going to see slime yeah, and so conclusions, uh, we've got lots of new options. Uh, new inhalers improve convenience because now they're all once a day. There's a large uh, net meet in compliance and obviously much more focus on integrated care that's going to drive COPD therapy. 
So thanks for your attention. I think we got a few minutes for questions. Or not? No. no. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm around all weekend, so uh, catch me later. And plus, on the cases, they can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So write your questions down, and because I don't want to try to not to go over time too okay, much. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you, Charlie.